probably going to find out about it anyway. So here's a little preemptive truth telling. There's no happy ending. One, two, three, four. Chef Anthony Bourdain. Anthony Bourdain. Anthony Bourdain. The renowned chef and best-selling author of Kitchen Confidential. All the TV chefs are so cuddly and adorable, you know, maybe I'm the antidote or something. Has a new program, Parts Unknown. One minute I was standing next to a deep fryer, and the next I was watching the sunset over the Sahara. What am I doing here? And nothing feels better than leaving home. The bittersweet curse. Travel isn't always pretty. You go away, you learn. You get scarred, marked, changed in the process. This is great, this theater. I have a long history with this theater. Yeah? The first, um, I was working as a journalist right after I graduated from college in San Francisco and um, Roger and me opened up in one screen in New York and this theater in LA, and I convinced my roommate to drive from San Francisco to LA to see a matinee and then back to San Francisco. <laughs> wow. And, uh, and it's part of what got me excited about what documentary could do. Yeah, I remember when that film came out, it was a yeah. game changer. Yeah. Um, like a wildly entertaining documentary. Yeah, who knew? Yeah, yeah. well, here we are. Um, so, first of all, congratulations on this film. I watched it again. I, I saw it back when it initially came out and watched it again. And it's, it's so powerful and so personal. Um, but let me ask, did you ever meet Anthony Bourdain? I'm curious. I never met him. Um, you know, I, I'm friends I, uh, with David Chang uh, and David Cho. And I got to know them because I did a show called Ugly Delicious with them. And... I got to know a lot of people in that kind of food world and people at Lucky Peach Magazine that was this kind of great alt food magazine and and everybody talked about Uncle Tony the whole time and he was, you know, we don't even talk about it, but he did so much to help so many other people. He had a, a publishing imprint where he would publish writers he liked and emerging voices he liked and he, when they were trying to get their magazine off the ground, you know, he gave them money, he wrote articles for them, you know. Like he was just a total patron saint, and mm -hmm. but literally he was Uncle Tony to everybody. Yeah. And um, and when he died, I saw all of my friends go through this incredible grief. Yeah. Um, but still, at that time, I wasn't thinking I was going to make a documentary about it. It was just just this great sadness, and me. I think what I felt personally was here's somebody who's showing more of the world to the rest of the world than just about anybody else on this planet. Mm -hmm. And like, he was fighting the good fight and what the fuck are we gonna do without him? I mean, he's like right. one of the, there's so little kind of empathy going around these days and just understanding of other cultures that um, it felt like a defeat in that way, you know? And then when CNN had this idea to make a film and they came to me you know, my first reaction was yes, because cause I felt like he was kind of a documentary filmmaker. I right. felt like we were on this same journey and I make films about culture and the stuff he was interested in was the stuff I was interested in and, and I felt on an idea level that I was really attracted to it. Um, I had that, as, as the second time I watched the film, I actually found myself thinking about you and like essentially what you just said, like he, he he was, a, in his own way, a documentary filmmaker, and so you're making a film about someone in your exact, you know, calling. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I got, just today, I got an email from a well-known documentary filmmaker who had just watched the film last night, who just said, this film, I know what it's like to be on the road 250 days a year yeah, shooting. Yeah, right. And that this film actually was spoke to me in a way that I felt like it was about my experience and the kind of both the beauty and the dislocation that happens with living a life like that. Um, and that was like, I, I think yeah. actually the email I got this morning was the best review I got. I mean, it just made yeah. me so happy. Yeah. Um, because it's interesting, you know, I've, I've made a, you know, making documentaries, you tend to not think of them as being autobiographical. Um, 
but they all are in their own way, you know, right. which is interesting. Nobody ever talks about this in documentary, but I think we all explore our own issues um, through other people's issues. We're attracted to stories because there are things we're trying to work out too. Yeah. Well, so in so much conversation around documentary, people immediately hone in on the subject matter of the film, of course, and also then the conversation often goes to, you know, what's the social impact of the documentary, which, all of which is great. But I want to take a moment to talk to you about, I'd love to hear you talk about um, kind of the artistry behind the film and how you approach this in terms of creating the film visually and um, like the visual composition. How, when you started the film, what, what were you thinking in terms of how you wanted to structure the film visually, how you wanted to shoot it, um, editing techniques, like, you know, the, the, the artistry of filmmaking that suited this subject. I mean, that, I did kind of what I do when I start films, and I've made a lot of music films, but it's funny, I, I was just thinking about it. it, it's kind of been dawning on me that even the films I make that aren't about music are, they have a lot of music in them. You know, I made a film about Mr. Rogers, it doesn't seem to be about music, but he was a music major in college. He wrote 200 songs. He was an amazing piano player. And there was yeah. a musicality to it. And Tony was a huge music fan, huge. And one of the first things I did was start collecting any song he ever mentioned or used anywhere. And by the end of the film, I had a 21 hour playlist of every song, wow. which I put it up on Spotify. So if you want to like, it's the best jukebox ever. If you, if you I'm assuming Roadrunner, the Jonathan Richmond song. The Jonathan Richmond song was on there. Yeah. And that was, it was also one of those, when I heard that song, I said, well, that should be the title of the movie. I mean, this is before we've made the movie. Wow. You know, one of those, I second guessed myself for a year and a half, but I couldn't come up with anything better. And knowing how he loved that song, that it was this Massachusetts, you know, and yeah. kind of the same generation as Tony in many ways, and like, and what that song means, and then, um, uh, you know, do, do you know who Grail Marcus is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he had written a book called Lipstick Traces that came out the summer I graduated from college, the summer, the year I saw Mike, uh, Roger and me, and Lipstick Traces has a whole chapter about that song and kind of all the layers of it and what it means. Um, and then Grail sent me an email a couple weeks ago oh, talking wow. about Roadrunner and how much he loved it. Oh. And I was able to say to him, had you not written that book, I don't know if I would have called this movie Roadrunner because it connected me to that song in a deeper way. Yeah. So all these just <laughs> things from my life that keep circling back again in a way that to me feels personal but that nobody else would ever right. know. Um, but so all to answer your question, it was the music. I went back and watched he, he, at different times, people would ask him his favorite movies or he'd put, put a list of his 10 favorite movies or whatever. And I watched everything. I went back and reread, you know, um, Joseph Conrad and Graham Greene and Hunter Thompson and all of the kind of his favorite writers. And just to kind of get, and part of it is he had awesome taste. <laughs> you know, like it wasn't a, a struggle to yeah. kind of, go into that and kind of take it in um, and just to kind of get a feel for who he was in that way and, and kind of what would inform the film. Um, and virtually every song in the movie comes from Tony's playlist, except for maybe one or two. Um, and then, you know, deciding to shoot all the interviews with people sitting at a table, you know, like we're breaking bread in a way. And, mm -hmm. um, but the other thing was just that it could never be a greatest hits album, <laughs> you know, that it, it would be really easy to be like, oh, you know, remember that story from Kitchen Confidential, or remember that episode, or remember this thing, or, you know, this great, you know, his sidekick from here, or whatever, and I was like, I, it's not about that at all. It's just trying to find who this guy is psychologically and what was motivating him through his life. And so we had to be really focused on what the film was going to be because we had 20,000 hours of footage, which is an wow. insane amount of footage. And so just the manpower to go through, we didn't end up even going through all 20,000 hours. We went through about 12,000 hours. And part of it is not all 20,000 hours are, a lot of it is duplicate footage or, there were definitely a number of episodes he did that 
his his crew is like there's always like one episode a year where he Tony just wanted to do an episode on a beach. <laughs> it was like his vacation episode, right. you know, where he was phoning it in. Um, so you know, and we even looked at a bit of that, but there was just so much. But then once it became apparent, then I found this photographer who had begun shooting a documentary about Tony right at the moment of publication of Kitchen Confidential. So all of that early footage in the film comes from this guy, Dimitri uh, Tomikin, I think, um, mm. who shot for a year, he shot 60 hours, he never finished the film, and he had it in a box. And getting that footage and transferring it and looking at it, and I was like, oh my God, this is the beginning of the film, and then I very quickly realized it could be immersive, like in that way. You know, there are barely, yeah. there are only a couple of, you know, like two photographs in the whole film. Like it's really a, I wanted to make it a right. active film, you know, and I think, I mean, we had so many rules about, about it, but I think one thing I was really trying to correct for was it's very easy in the wake of somebody's death, particularly a suicide like this that's traumatic, to see everything backwards through the filter of that. And so when we started, uh, Eileen Meyer, one of my editors, um, I said to her, we're gonna start at the beginning and we're not gonna think about what happens to Tony, at least for the next four months, <laughs> literally. Like, I don't want you to look at those parts of the interviews, I don't want you to look at archive. Like, we're just gonna go from the beginning because that's how you live, you know. You know, you don't read it backwards, you read it, right, you right. live it forwards. And we cut the first 40 minutes like that. Wow. Um, you know, we revised it and everything, but it was just this sense of excitement and possibility and naivete and all these things oh, yeah. that he had. I mean, that, um, the, those scenes of him signing books for Kitchen Confidential, yeah. he's so like goofy and yeah. boyish and like naive. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just that like irrepressible energy. And um, it was so great to see that. Like yeah. I've never really seen that yeah. before. You know, and even somebody has kind of has such a kind of a uh, a world weary persona. Even in Kitchen Confidential, he yeah. does. He'd already been a junkie at that point, right? Yeah. I mean, so he had been. Yeah, but he sure is kind of ex excited little boy when all of this stuff is happening. Yeah, you know, and it was such an. I mean, what be, it was one of those decisions at the beginning, rather than trying to tell his story from birth to death, that. The story that was more interesting to me was somebody who in middle age is suddenly given a life-changing success and opportunity, and does that make him happy? Does that fix him in a way? Right. I mean, it's, that's so unusual. I mean, he was 43 when Kitchen Confidential was published. Wow. And to see, I mean, if you go back and reread Kitchen Confidential, there is such a sense of having lived his life and his story is over. And there's even this passage in Kitchen Confidential where he talks about um, basically saying, if I, he, because it's Tony, he has this colorful metaphor. He says, you know, if, I, if I'm walking across the street and an ice cream truck hits me and I'm there lying in the street with a bumper sticking out of my head and my dying words, you know, you know what am I gonna think about? And he says, you know, I'm not gonna think about opportunities I didn't have, or places I didn't go, or foods I didn't eat, or women I didn't sleep with. You know, it's like, I'm not gonna regret any of that. I'm just gonna regret the disappointment and pain I left in the lives of people mm. I left behind. You know, yeah. he wrote that when he was 42. Wow. Um, I, did, it's, well, I mean, you sort yeah. of answered the next question I was gonna ask, which is the framing of the film. You start with Kitchen Confidential, so you don't get that whole preamble of his early life and boyhood and, um, and but I'm curious like wh how you came to the decision to start where you did, but also to end where you did. I mean, obviously there's a natural ending, he committed suicide, but you go beyond that. There's, I mean, to me the most, the, I, I found the whole film moving, but the, that end part where you see his friends talking and just the palpable grief that they still feel like, his story lives on beyond him and the impact it had on, on the, the people in his life. So I'm just curious, how did you determine yeah. like, where does this start and where do I well, end? Because part of it is, 
in, in going back and rereading Kitchen Confidential, I feel like that book does it so well. It tells that, I mean, I kind of feel like if you really want to understand Tony, read Kitchen Confidential and watch the documentary. Yeah. You know, and it's not that there's anything contradictory about those two tellings, but you'll, you get his voice and then you get kind of what happened to him when he wasn't writing about himself in the same mm -hmm. way. Um, and whenever I tried to kind of get more, in, you know, and I played with it and I interviewed some of the chefs who were from that part of his life, but it started to feel like a greatest hits album. Like, oh, remember that great story of Kitchen Confidential? Well, here's somebody telling you that story with no footage and no photos. And it just tonally, everything about it was just very different. Yeah. And, and also, you know, we're trying to condense, you know, I feel like my job is, you know, I, I talk about essentializing, you know, that, you know, when you're making a documentary, you're not writing a book. It's so reductive. You know, and you're not, so you're really just trying to kind of have some kind of an understanding or of an essence of a person rather than a A to Z. Like, that's what Wikipedia is for. Right. You know, this is trying to just understand what makes a person tick. And so starting, I mean, that was kind of what got me starting the film where we started. And then the experience of making the film, the thing I didn't fully realize when I first began the film was how much I was making a film about suicide. Um, and my experience of making the film was one of intense grief. Um, you know, when I sat down with the people in the film, and I actually, I think there are 18 people in the film, but I interviewed almost twice that many. Um, and that, and that's because I wanted the viewer to actually build a relationship with everybody in the film. And I'd never done this before where I introduce everybody in the film. So hopefully you actually understand everybody's connection to Tony so that when he dies, you feel the grief because you know these people. Yeah. And it was my experience in making the film. Like I loved the people I got to know from Tony's world yeah. and they've become friends of mine. And I just saw two of them last week when I was in New York and and they're like, whether or not you like it, Morgan, you're now part of Tony's crew. <laughs> you know, and yeah. it's like this, um, you know, um, club of people who have been through the shit, I guess. Could you and, talk a bit about how, you, I was really curious, those interviews, yeah. right, we've all seen lots of documentaries with talking head interviews in the film. This is not what this was. These were, as you see, they're seated at tables, but more than that, they're, they're like, I'm curious how, what, I'd love to hear you talk about how you shot them like in, in some detail, like, like how did you establish the mood, the, the, the sense of the set to get them to, because they're, they open up so much and are so personal. To, and one thing I love in the film is you have throughout, it's, it's short moments, but you, you'll hold on someone's face when they're not talking, like before they speak. And there's just so much happening. Like, they don't need to say anything. In that moment, like with the shots that you get, you see this play of emotion, whether it's grief or joy or anger, whatever's going on, like it feels, so I'm just curious like what the, what the set was like, how you were like. I mean, these were, the, these were the longest, hardest interviews I've ever done for a documentary. And like I've been doing documentaries for a long time and I've done a lot of interviews. I love doing interviews, um, but these were not interviews, they were therapy sessions. Right. And you know, I think Otavia says in the film that, you know, this is the last time she's ever gonna talk publicly about it. I think there were right. like six people said that to me in making the film. Um, just that it was the time to talk about it and that even people, so like Chris and Lydia, the two producers who had started his production company with him, um, in the wake of his death, it was like them trying to go into panic mode and figure out what was gonna happen with their company and their lives and everything. And, and when I sat down to talk to them a year and a half later, Lydia was the first interview I did and Chris was the last interview I did. And Lydia said, Chris and I have never talked about this. We're married, we work with Tony for 20 years. Wow. And we've never like had to sit down and say, how are you processing this? What do you think? And so I think also with suicide, that's very common because 
it's such a fucked up thing because it's tied up with feelings of guilt. What should I have done? I experienced a lot of people saying that and feeling different versions of, you know, guilt and anger and, um, but people don't feel like they have permission to talk about their grief in some, particularly around suicide. And so when I showed up and I was like, let's just talk about it, that those conversations became, hopefully for them, therapeutic. You know, they were intense, but in a way that I felt honored that they were opening up like that. And many of the people I talked to beforehand often would have a meal with them beforehand, not to talk about Tony much, but just to like, right. So I wasn't a stranger, yeah. you know, and, you know, and I think my way of doing interviews is like, we're just having a conversation and at some point they're filming and they're, and we're going for hours. You know, these were long for me, long interviews. So they were, I know maybe averaging three hours. I'm curious, were you seated at the table across yeah. from them? So yeah. you were like right there. It was not, yeah. you weren't back with the cameras or in video no, no. village. I was or just sitting right? there and, I mean, also, you know, it's part of how I like to do interviews, which is like I had a piece of paper, but I never looked at right. paper. I never broke eye contact with right. people yeah. talking to them for three hours, you know, it was, and then. It was like, you just tell me, and I may not get what everything I need, but that's, it's more important for me to be engaged with you and us just to have the most right. real conversation we can have. Yeah. And then, and then it, there's just like a moment where it feels like, okay, we've reached some place and like, it just, it's, it's over. Like, right. I don't want to keep fishing for more stuff. Like, yeah. That's it's it. lived its life and like the interview's done. Um, and you, you, in the, it, my, you had two cameras yeah. through most of that. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, you know, a lot of times people are like, oh, talking heads. You know, there's a lot of kind of eye rolling about talking head documentaries, but, um, and even other documentaries, which are great, you know, but a documentary like, I don't know, Amy or something, which is a great documentary, but no talking heads, just interviews, audio interviews. But to me, like, I just love people's faces, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, a film like Won't You Be My Neighbor, I ended the whole movie on a montage of people's faces not talking. Oh, I see. Incredible you know, ending. It's like I, yeah. to me, that's how I connect to people and feel through them, so. I mean, so every, I mean I, yeah, yeah it, it definitely comes through in the film. I mean, I'm thinking of David Chang and David Cho and, his producers like, yeah, you, it's the faces that reveal their history with him, yeah. wh no matter what they're saying. Yeah, and I, I think if I'd made this film, you know, in five years from now, it wouldn't be quite the same film. I mean, I think the film is also a reflection of my experience of making the film, which was grief, yeah. you know, and all those other emotions, but it was just raw, you know, and so, you know, I've seen documentaries that deal with suicide where you know you kind of they explain why somebody kills himself and then the film's over but you don't deal with what it left behind afterwards and I think my experience of what was left behind afterwards was so profoundly strong that I felt like I had to honor that by just telling that part of the story you know just because in terms of the suicide of it, I mean, I think part of Tony felt that, you know, there's the stupid live fast, die young, kind of there's something romantic about suicide. Mm -hmm. Tony was always interested in suicide. I mean, he could tell you every famous person that ever killed themselves and how, like, he joked about it. I mean, I think we have one or two examples, but there were many, many, many examples of him joking about it. Um, and that's bullshit. Right. You know, it just is, you know, and I think that's the thing that I at least wanted to reflect, not to diminish from his pain or what he was going through, but to give equal weight to the pain 
it left that there's nothing cool about it. You at least know that. Yeah. Right. That there's nothing cool about leaving a 12 year old daughter behind. You know, there's just the, the kind of devastation, you know, and, and, uh, yeah. And now, you know, almost four years later, it's, uh, I mean, I think people, you know, I mean, it's, uh, I'm happy to see how much better everybody is doing, you know, and, and in a way, I feel like the film was not only an act of therapy for them, <laughs> an act of therapy for me. Hopefully, it was some kind of an act of therapy for the people that saw the film. Um, because when I talked about this film in the beginning and I would tell people I was making a film about Anthony Bourdain, often I would get this reaction like, um, oh my God, I loved him, I loved that show, but it was so sad what happened, I just, I, you know, I, I, can't even, I can't even think about him, I can't watch him, I can't, you know, like, it was such a disconnect for people that I think people just wanted to block him out because it was just all unprocessed. Like, I don't know what to make of that. It was just right. horrible, so. It this, and, this might yeah. sound crazy, I, I don't know, but it, to me, so on the one hand, he was an clearly an extraordinary individual, right? I mean, he was enormously talented and charismatic and an unusual person. But on the other hand, as I was watching the film, I do think, I mean, to your point I, of the audience reaction, in some way, I think a lot of people identify with him, like I, I do, and not that I'm an Anthony Bourdain, but there's a quality that he has and a outlook on the world that I think is common to a lot of people. And so, you know, and, and a kind of darkness and attractive, attractiveness to that sort of, you know, dark elements of life and to see where the film goes and his suicide and how it affects people resonates like, you, you take it in personally, like, yeah, this isn't just some extraordinary guy who killed himself. This could be me. Like, this could be one of my friends. This is like, these are people I understand and care about, and like it, 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 it I think it resonates in that way it, for a lot of people who see the film. And I think that's part of the incongruity of his death, that people are like, how could this guy, who was yeah. so smart and had, I mean, right. you know, after he died, Dave Chappelle did his first Netflix special, if you remember this, and he came out, the first joke, first thing he says in his first Netflix special is, you know, a joke where he says essentially, Anthony Bourdain, had the best life ever, could do, go anywhere, saw the world, and that dude killed himself, you know? So what hope is there for the rest of us? Right. And I think it, that was what a lot of people were thinking. You know, it's like, how the hell could this person that had the perfect life kill themselves? And of course, you know, mental health and all those other things, you know, it's, you know, that's, that it's facile for us to think that way, and it's good to remind ourselves that people are way more complicated than yeah. what you see on the surface. Um, and Tony, I mean, the thing that I struggle with, you know, somebody had written a New Yorker profile of Tony, and they, being the New Yorker, they said uh, that Tony was a Apollonian disguised as a Dionysian. <laughs> <laughs> Very New Yorker. Um, but when I unpack that, you know, it's like, Tony was like an uptight, anal guy who thought he was Keith Richards. You know? Right. That's essentially what that means. Yeah. You know? He was hyperpunctual. He was, you know, very responsible. Um, but he loved Iggy and Keith and the guys who were the quintessential Dionysian figures, you know, like the attic rock and roll guys that live forever and like, um, but it, to me, it always seemed like Tony wasn't really that. He just admired it, but that wasn't really in his bones. And I think at times he tried to go, I mean, he became a junkie, you know, in a right. way that he even says was like fully romantic, the idea of, he knew exactly what he was signing up for. Yeah, right. Um, and I think he often did. Like there was this sense of like, well, this isn't working, something in my life isn't working, I'm just gonna try and blow it up in a different way and kind of with, you know, drugs or relationships or whatever, you know, that it was something that to me, I still don't fully, it just doesn't seem him because he wasn't, Right. he was too uptight except, but again, you know, in a, you know, with, 
the right circumstances or drugs or mental health that, you know, people aren't themselves, you know, and I, I think Tony was certainly not himself when he killed himself. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, the day he killed himself, he was giving notes on edits and making lunch plans for the following week. Wow. I mean, it was not somebody who was signaling that they were going to kill themselves. Right. You know, I just think it was a bad moment. Yeah. You know, that's all it takes. Um, I want to ask you, so you said there's 20,000 20, hours of archival footage, which I believe, and I mean, you did an amazing job. I don't know what, uh, how many hours you looked at, but the, the, what you've assembled here is incredible in terms of the archival stuff. And I, I want to ask you, I mean, um, well, one question, I'm sure it comes from different sources. A lot of it comes from the shows, but there was some footage there that seemed very personal. And I was like, what is this from? Like with the scene when he's lying on the couch, yeah. like he's obviously performing yeah. for camera on almost all of it, but like when he's doing the therapy yeah. thing, was that part of a show? And, yeah, and since a, you mentioned Iggy, there's a great scene between him and Iggy where Iggy talks mm -hmm. about how the greatest thing is being loved, mm -hmm. which is like... It's so exactly what Tony needed to hear. Yeah, but the look on Tony's face when he hears it is like, I don't think Tony's feeling it. Like, there's like a sadness yeah. in his reaction. I mean, it's, there were a lot of things. Like, the, the therapy session, he, you know, it was a Buenos Aires episode. And um, I guess more people were in psychotherapy in Argentina than any other country on the planet. So they thought it would be fun to go okay. have Tony go to do therapy. Um, <laughs> And so they set it up and they shot for 90 minutes. Like it starts kind of as him doing shtick and he's like, oh, if I see, have one more bad hamburger in the airport, I'm gonna, you know, <laughs> jump off a building. And like, he's kind of just doing his shtick. And then at a certain point, you know, it, he gets much more real. And I'm not saying it, it's not at all performative, um, but you know, after 90 minutes, it was like, I felt like he was really talking about real. I know he was talking about real things. And, and something else he did in, um, when they would shoot, his, his crew talked about this, that when he would sit down with people, he would often uh, talk about him, his own like worst <laughs> moments, like from the beginning, or his own problems. I mean, uh, I talked to David Simon, who said that... Uh, the first thing Tony said to him was, oh, you're from Baltimore. You know, I tried to score heroin in Baltimore and couldn't. To which David Simon said, you must have been a horrible junkie then, because it's everywhere. Um, wow. But I think, so what his crew said, would they would sit down, and for the first 20 minutes, Tony would go on about himself and talk. While the cameras were rolling? While the cameras were rolling, yeah. and the crew's thinking, come on, we're already on to the deep in the entree. You know, like we've gone through appetizers, and like, and then he would shut up and people would open up because Tony had opened up to them. Yeah. But they never used that footage. Right, you right. Know, um, but you did. I mean, it's yeah. amazing, the, the outtakes. Uh, what's, in, what's most remarkable to me about the, the film with the, in terms of the archival footage is how you build... Right? His character was the same. I mean, he, he obviously changed as he aged, but his character was his character. But through the archival footage, I got this clear sense of there's a progression from that boyish, happy energy, even with the darkness already there from Kitsch and Confidential, progressing through like what happened in Lebanon and the shift there and then Libya. And, you know, like there's a progression of ma maturity in a way, not just going darker, but like he's becoming right, he, uh, his perspective on the world is changing and his perspective on the value of his work is changing and you, you really capture that through the film and then of course up into yeah. what happened at the end of his I life. Mean, I think he was both, I mean, there are all these progressions happening. I think he's becoming both more worldly and then becoming kind of world weary in a way. Right. And I feel like he saw so much suffering, I guess, and difficult, the kind of intractability of how fucked up so much of this world is that I think he became less optimistic. You know, just, you know, people aren't, right. not many people see as much of the world as he saw. Very, very, very few people do. Um, I mean, the fact that he became, I've said, agoraphobic. 
Yeah. Was so I think it started to take a kind of a psychological toll on him, too, you know, because he was very empathetic and he really felt these things. He wasn't just, you know, showing up and talking about food and leaving. Right. You know, like he was invested, and so I think there was a, a certain kind of like. Yeah, just uh, being, it's not even burnt out. It's just kind of almost more more kind of existential feeling of, you know, if this isn't bringing me the joy it used to bring me, then what is there, you know? Because it brought him so much joy to have that experience of having yeah. everything open up that way. Um, yeah, yeah, and it was hard. And, you know, it, it's not... I mean, he obviously, you know, was addicted to work, um, you know, and workaholism is like the last socially acceptable addiction in this country, yes. you know, so, um, and it worked for him for a long time until it didn't. Yeah. And I think that's part of what he was wrestling with too at the end. It's like, it's, it wasn't enough anymore. So I'm sure there were many of these moments for you, but when you were in the process of going through all that archival footage, were there moments where, and there's, I mean, there's so much good stuff, but were there moments where you saw a clip that just was like electrified? You were like, this, these hidden nuggets where you're like, oh my God, this is gonna be, this is, we did not expect to get this, and this is going in the film. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, there are many of them are in the film, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, there's a quick shot of, I don't even know if you can tell what it is. There's just this Tony, this old lady walks up to Tony while he's standing there and takes his hand, this like 95 year old lady, you know, doesn't speak English and just like holds his hand, you know, and Tony, yeah. it's just like this amazing um, kind of vulnerable Tony, you know, and then there was a the mo moment of him dancing with his shirt off and everything. And, and when I was hanging out with one of his directors, he's like, oh, Tony never would have left, let us use that footage because he just was so self-conscious about, you know, he wanted to be cool or whatever. Right. And like, um, and so, you know, Tony, you know, was very prescriptive about what he wanted to do on camera in the show. And I think we wanted to treat the footage as verite footage. It's like, found footage and trying to explore these real moments. Um, I mean, there was another scene we had that we, that just ended up not fitting, but where he, um, he gets a tattoo in, uh, I think he's in Miami, and he gets a tattoo that says, um, in ancient Greek, it says, I believe in nothing. Um, which sounds kind of cool, like kind of Zen or Buddhist, you know, that, you know, I'm, un I'm uncertain of everything. You know, it's translated different ways, you know. And if you're 60 and you're truly uncertain of everything, then you're lost. And there was something about Tony being this searcher character. Yeah. That if you're, and searching is great, being curious is great, being out right. in the world is great, but if you do it to that extent, you're really running away from something. Like you don't know where you are. Right. If you're a profound searcher, which, and if you really don't believe in anything, if you don't believe in the love of people around you, you know, if you don't believe in um, what's true and right, you know, like if you really doubt everything, then that's, especially at that age, you know, it's one thing if you're a teenager, but at that age, there's something sad about that to me. I mean, in the film, I felt the moment when he separates or divorces from Otavia mm -hmm. felt like a real turn, like people get divorced all the time, but like in the film, it feels like a real, something in him where he, he's becoming unmoored, from, not just from her, but from, you know, family and the bonds of... I mean, I think his way of dealing with it was, um, I tried to be normal, it didn't work out. Right, right. I mean, really, you know. So when he got divorced, he started smoking again, he started drinking a lot more, he started doing more soft drugs. Um, his voice got heavier, his leather jacket came back. 
you know, I mean, it was, you, we heard it, you could hear it in just listening to his voice, you know, how different yeah. it was. Um, yeah, it was like some version of the old Tony, but it, you know, that with kind of less. A more weary Yeah, version. a more weary version yeah. of it. Yeah. Um, and I think everybody saw how troubling that was at the time. And I think eventually he did. I mean, he finally went into therapy for the f first time in his life just about two and a half months before he died. Wow. And so I think he was aware that things weren't going well. He just didn't have the tools to deal with it. I have one last question, which is, um, I'm curious, since the film came out, um, I'm assuming a, a lot of people in the film mm -hmm. and in Tony's life have seen it, and I'm just mm -hmm. curious, like, what, anything you'd care to share, what you've heard back, like, how is the film resonating for them, and are you getting surprising reactions from people, or? Yeah, I've gotten so many great reactions. I mean, I, I you know, I think, um, I mean, people like, I mean, I don't think I'm telling tales out of school, but like, like Eric Repair did not want to do an interview. Um, and, and I had a long talk with him as to why I thought he should talk and why it was sensitive to what his unique position, because he was there with Tony when Tony died. Um, you know, in staying in the same hotel, and he found Tony's body with mm. the police. And um, and he really kind of grilled me, and we had a long talk, and then um, and then he agreed to do the interview. And then when he saw the film, he sent me an email. He was like, "You fucking did it! Like you." Tony would be so proud of this. <laughs> and I, you know, it's like things like that that I'm like, yeah, you know, it's for, you know, I feel like it, it's funny because in the beginning I felt, in the very beginning I felt like I'm making this film for Tony in a way. Like he's my audience because I want him to see all the DNA of the music and the film and all the energy and all this stuff. And then at a certain point as I was making the film, I was like, I'm actually making it for the people in Tony's life. You know, it became, it turned at a certain point. Because there's part of the story that Tony shouldn't like. Um, yeah. And, and I feel, you know, I feel good about that. You know, I, I, you know, you'd never, you know, it, we're all insecure artists. We don't say, I ah, nailed it. You know, but at least I felt like, I, I, what I can say is like we worked so hard on this film and we're so intentional about everything that I felt like we, we didn't want to ever feel like we hadn't really thought through everything and every edit. Um, and so, you know, I felt like we did the best we could do and that's all you can do. Um, including my insanely amazing editors, uh, Aaron Wickenden and Eileen yeah. Meyer. Amazing. Um, and we all just, and we also edited this whole thing in COVID, which was insane. Um, but we couldn't go anywhere except with Tony. You know, it was actually kind of an amazing experience to be traveling the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As we're making this wow. film, more we're all just stuck, you know, by ourselves. Um, were you editing t together in one room, or it was remote and you guys were communicating over? I mean, the Zoom first or two or three months of editing, Eileen and I were together, uh, and then COVID hit, and then we were. Now there are all these software programs where you can. I could be looking at her edit screen, and we could be talking, and you know, it, yeah. it, it kind of sucks, but it works. And like, and then Aaron came in, and he was in Chicago. You know, and so we, it was just one of those things. It was very unusual, and I'd actually shot pretty much the whole film before COVID, except for two interviews, um, Atavia and Helen, Helen Cho, two very important interviews. Um, 
Sorry, was Helen the crew member? Yeah, the yeah, Korean. She's amazing. Yeah, she's great. And I had um, I had many meal. I had at least two meals with each of them beforehand. Like I'd actually spent a lot of time with them, so it wasn't like I was a stranger. And I just and this was like the first, you know, in early COVID. And I was like, I just I can't finish this film without these two interviews, you know. And so I I did it in I was here in L.A. and they were in New York and I had a crew in New York and I did them by Zoom. Oh my God, which was you know hard and had I not spent a lot of time with them beforehand um, I don't know if I could have done that um, but it was just and I think it worked I think I mean oh, those interviews you can't tell are, no <laughs> so, no you can't tell but um, and I, 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 I wouldn't zoom. you know I wouldn't like to do that I mean <laughs> yeah I, yeah I wow I would have gotten on a plane to do it but nobody would have let me right right yeah well, Morgan, thank you so much. Congratulations on the film. Yeah. And, uh, thank you so much for coming out, in. everybody.